Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Junot. I'm an associate astronomer at NSF Snore Lab. I'm also a scientist at the Astro Data Lab and a member of the DESI team. So I'm excited to be telling you about Jupyter-enabled analysis for researchers and students. Before moving on, I want to acknowledge some colleagues in particular from the Astro Data Lab team at Moore Lab and also from the DESI team. So there has been a big change in the way that we do research in astronomy. It used to be that the main, most typical scenario would be to um, have either individual researchers or maybe a small team to go to the telescope to gather their data, get their observations, and then upload those to their computers where they have also installed software to process and analyze the data locally on a local computer. Uh, so this still requires some fairly sophisticated software just because in astronomy we tend to be looking for a very faint signal. So we have to do a very accurate sky subtraction and also accurate correction for any source of noise, including detector noise and so on. But regardless, the main uh, way of working used to be uh, very local and then with then result in papers that are published in professional journals. Um, there have been a few major changes with the years. So one big change has been the tendency to more and more have larger teams or collaborations. So the main difference there is that several people who are the team members will need access to the same data. So one way to do this is people can simply download the data, whether this is done from a FTP or through a web browser. Um, and then uh, most typically people would still work locally with their software and pipelines on their, on their computers, uh, except with a, a nice interesting difference is that people would more often share intermediate or advanced data products. For example, it could be generating a catalog of measurements and then other team members might need the same table or catalog. Uh, and as a result, then there will be multiple papers and multiple results that are published in journals. Another way to do research, which has been more and more prevalent, is so-called data-driven or archive-driven astronomy. So in the most extreme case, people no longer even need to go to the telescope anymore because Possibly the data to answer a question already exists and they're located or stored in an archive or a data center. If the data volume becomes so large that it's prohibitive to simply download the data. So in that regime, then what uh, one needs to do is to instead work directly on a science platform. Um, so a science platform will basically be a, a suite of tools and services that are connected and can be working with the data without having to download a large amount of data. Um, so a science platform then is motivated by having a growth in both data volume and data complexity. Um, the goals of a science platform then is to make sure to maximize the scientific output of the community. So this means that the data need to be not only available, but easily discoverable, and they need to be a lot of different uh, versatile tools and also sophisticated and advanced enough software to do uh, the required analysis, which can include machine learning algorithms or, or other. Um, and we also want to make sure that the framework is conducive to doing very robust science. So it has to be reproducible. Uh, and it's also a, potentially a way to do this is for researchers to start publishing not just the results, but also publishing their actual workflow. Um, so the role of a science platform is also to train uh, and make it as easy as possible for people to basically hop on board. So we want to lower the barrier of entry, we want to make sure there's good tutorials and um, documentation, and we really want to target here the, the workforce at all career stages. So early career researchers, but also more advanced researchers who maybe have not used those tools before. So the first example science platform I'm going to talk about is the Astro Data Lab. So it is at NSF's 
National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory. And the main motivation behind the birth of the Astro Data Lab was the basically explosion in these very wide area surveys that started covering more and more of the sky. So what happened in the last decade, so you can see here these maps, uh, these ellipses represent the full sky coverage projected onto the, the ellipse. And from 2011 to 2019, you can see the rapid jump in how much of the sky has been covered. So this is what the color scheme is showing here. Going to green and then red is more and more exposures taken in the sky at these, these areas. So here um, you can see these sky map coverage from these mid-scale observatories. So they're four meter telescopes that have been used with wide field cameras. And this is another way to show this growth of data volume here is the size of the data holdings in the Noir Lab Astro Data Archive. So similar thing you can see from 2011 to now, this very rapid rise. And as of 2017, we've reached a petabyte scale in terms of data holdings. And this is uh, uh, comprising raw images, process images also, as well as high level data products. So really our mission at the Data Lab is to empower researchers uh, so that they can get new results and make new discoveries. Um, so we want to enable this, we want to have the tools and the software and the services co-located with the data. Uh, so we have very different types of data, um, including catalogs or tables. So these are mostly stored in databases. And they range from a few hundred thousand rows to our largest table right now has 68 billion rows. So that's a very large table. Uh, so we also have images, which are basically 2D arrays as well as file collections. So these collections are actually gonna be a mix. They will be catalogs, images, and possibly spectra. And on the right-hand side, you can see examples. So right, uh, recently, we started serving 1D spectra. So this is basically the trace of the spectrum. So you can see here the picture with six different spectra, uh, mostly of galaxies. And um, in the future, we will also have 2D spectra. So this is the same idea. Spectroscopy is dispersing the light, but it's also the image of the spectrum as opposed to just a trace. And in the future, we also will have the next level up, which is in 3D, so uh, 3D spectral data cubes. So how does Jupiter come into play? How do we use Jupiter at the Astro Data Lab? Uh, in a few different ways. So one is to directly enable the research. Most of our users are professional astronomers or graduate students. So we use Jupyter, uh, we have a notebook server that they can use to conduct their research. Uh, we also use example notebooks as part of our training and tutorials. So for training tutorials, we have a user manual, the example notebooks, uh, as well as we have been giving online webinars and also in-person tutorials. And the last category uh, for which we use the notebooks is for education. Um, so I'm listing here a couple of different highlights. One of them is the Teen Astronomy Cafe program. Uh, this is for middle to high school students and it's extracurricular. So typically students will do this on a Saturday. And it includes a computer activity, so typically with a Jupyter notebook uh, and also some hands-on activities. And more advanced, we now have um, notebooks from the La Serena School uh, for Data Science. So this is targeting undergraduate and graduate students uh, to learn to use data science for astronomy. And this is very exciting, it's brand new. We're just right now um, starting to put the notebooks into our collection. Uh, this was motivated because the 2020 school uh, was canceled because already those have been in person. So now we're migrating the content to Jupyter Lab so it could be also done remotely and, and virtually. And the last uh, example is uh, using it directly into the classroom. So um, we don't often go in the classrooms ourselves as a data lab team, but professors and teachers have been getting in touch with us. So we definitely work with them to help them get started. Um, so the Jupyter Notebook server is running on our end at the Data Lab, which means that the users don't need to install anything. They just need to point their browser to the Data Lab website, log in, and then they can uh, spin the Jupyter Notebook server. 
So for research, um, when researchers come to use notebooks and, and Jupyter at Data Lab, it comes with pre-installed software packages. So we have uh, a lot of the commonly used default libraries. So we have NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas. And for astronomy specifically, there's a package called AstroPy, which is also in Python, as well as a Data Lab package. So I will describe why we need the data lab package, but basically it's to connect Jupyter to the other functionality that we have at data lab. Um, all users have the same installation by, by default. Um, and, the, and I will describe more a bit later how they actually then can use a data lab command to connect with uh, our data that are on the server on the, on the backside. Um, and then the notebook can be used for analysis and visualization. We do provide some example cases that users can follow, and we also have a help desk and email to support researchers. Um, so the goal and the hope is that they're able to generate high-quality publication-ready figures that they can then uh, put in their articles and, and journals. So what's missing? So right now we don't have a way for users to, to um, tailor their own environment and install the, the software. Instead, as I mentioned before, all the users have the same installation at the moment. Uh, we have been responsive. Uh, if somebody asks us for a package that they're missing, we would normally look at the package and see if we can install it and add it. So this slide here shows a bit of a schematic way. Uh, these three main clients that are part of the Data Lab package so within a notebook, a user can use the authentication client, which is called auth client. This means that the user can sign in to their data lab account, which gives them access to storage. So each user account comes with one terabyte of virtual storage for files. And it also comes with storage for databases in the MyDB space. Um, so the other way that users will connect from the notebook to the data lab is there's a query client that will send queries. So queries can be written with SQL or ADQL. So they're um, query languages. And basically the query client will transfer the query to the query manager, will then retrieve the data from the database directly and send it back into the notebook. And let's say the store client will allow users to store files uh, or also to read files that they might have previously stored in their account. Um, so the order can be a little bit shuffled around here depending on the exact use case. And, the, and again, as I mentioned before, the hope is that at the end, the, the users manage to do their, their full analysis and produce their figures for, for their papers in, in the notebooks. So we have written a Jupyter Notebook collection, which has been put together by several members of the Data Lab team. And every user account comes with already pre-populated notebooks, so they get the full copy of their collection, uh, whatever was the latest collection that was created. Um, there is a way for users to then update their collection, so they can always see a read-only version of our notebook's latest. Uh, and I will show you how those are organized. So this means that if a user, say, doesn't connect for two or three or six months to their account and they come back and they see there's a bunch of new notebooks, they can actually make a copy that they can then work on and, and edit uh, as they please. Um, so the, the notebooks are currently organized in folders as is shown on the slide here. So we start with the most basic level, which is a getting started. So this is equivalent of the 101 kind of level. So how to use Python, how to use a notebook, how to use SQL, and so on. And then moving on is a data access notebook, which shows the most commonly used and kind of typical, but still somewhat basic ways of interacting with the data at Data Lab. And then we move on to a bit more uh, fully fleshed examples. So we have science use cases. So these science um, example notebooks are grouped by a scientific theme. And then, for example, whether it's like finding dwarf galaxies or exploring the large scale structure of the universe um, and, and, so, and, and more. So I will show you those the next slide. Uh, we also have these notebooks that we call how-tos. Uh, so th those tend to be a bit more technical. 
So there will be uh, something like how to use a query client, how to use a store client, but they will really be more thorough and explore the different keywords and the different options. So they're, they're more technical te tutorials. Uh, then we have Contrib, which stands for Contributed Notebooks. So this is fairly recent. So users can now contribute notebooks back to our collection. So we provide a template and instructions and we will first review the notebook and once we're happy with it, we will merge it with, with the collection. Um, the next category is EPO, which stands for Education and Public Outreach. So these will include the education cases I mentioned before. Um, and then we have a test, which is uh, a way to automatically test the notebooks to make sure that everything is still running as expected. Um, so for the science example notebooks, um, we have a lot of different data sets at Data Lab, for example, the dark energy survey and other surveys. So we try to be careful to make sure that there's a minimum of one example notebook per data set. Um, so we think that this will help the users not only to know what data sets are, but also how to actually use them for their science. On the left-hand side is as you would see it on GitHub. And on the right hand side is just looking in a notebook server. So you can see that these are the folders that are organized per science theme. And this is one particular case on the example collection. So the notebook is called Exploring Smash DR2. And this survey is targeting the Magellanic Clouds. So there's a large and a small Magellanic Clouds, which are two very small neighbor galaxies to the Milky Way. And the survey uh, was designed with mosaics around these two galaxies, but also somewhat in between and, and outside of them because they are stellar streams. So the stars that were basically torn from the galaxies or from other galaxies from tidal like gravitational interaction. Um, so this notebook follows a typical structure. So there's a title and then imports packages. So you can see here kind of a typical uh, example of possible packages. And in this particular case, what I'm showing is a part of the notebook that does a query that will be a group per hill picks. So hill picks is a way to tile the sky and then different um, number of sides would make finer or larger uh, hill picks or tiles. Um, in this case, it will count per uh, hill picks how many objects there are to then produce a, a number density map. So this map that you show here on the, the right hand side, the yellow color shows where there's many more objects per area. And this is projected onto the, the sky is projected onto a sphere in this case. And what you can see, this is a log scale. So in yellow, there's many more objects, in this case, stars. And we see easily the small and the large magnetic clouds where there are many more stars. So overall, this query returned 193 million and some stars uh, in total for this map. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the details, but I just want to point out that we have a way to automatically test a notebook. So there's a poster on this topic by my colleague, Robert Nikuta, that goes through the whole end-to-end uh, -end notebook lifecycle, and then uh, it will run automatically to the collection and show us what has passed or failed the, the testing. So now I want to move on to the second example that's from your platform, which is used for the DESI collaboration. So DESI is a dark energy spectroscopic instrument. And this instrument um, is going to be used to, over the course of five years to survey over a third of the sky. Um, and then this actually part of the sky has already been uh, covered with images. And the images so far, uh, we have large catalogs with 1.6 billion objects, which include stars, galaxies, and quasars. So the idea behind DESI is among these 1.6 billion objects is to select 35 million galaxies and quasars in order to measure their distance from us. So we do this with spectroscopy, uh, with uh, measuring the redshift, which we can convert into a distance. But what we get is we have these 35 million points in 3D after we get a distance. 
So therefore, we have the largest 3D map of the universe, and this is how we can actually learn about dark energy. Um, so dark energy is really, we don't know exactly the nature yet, but we know that it's driving the expansion of the universe. So depending of the exact nature and property of dark energy, it will produce a different 3D map. So that's why we need to first measure this map, and then we compare it to different cosmological models in order to infer what dark energy is. So this is pretty exciting. Um, there's already over 800 researchers in the collaboration and spread around 93 different institutions in different countries. The DESI instrument is installed on the 4-meter telescope in Kitt Peak, Kitt Peak, Arizona. So the telescope is shown. This was before DESI was actually installed, but that's the telescope inside the dome. Uh, and what happens is the light hits the primary mirror, goes to the DESI instrument where these uh, 5,000 <laughs> optical fibers, and each fiber is actually attached to a small robot, which is a positioner. And the positioner will position exactly the fiber on the sky so that it's exactly in line with either a star or a galaxy or a quasar, like the object is gonna take a spectrum of. And then on the right side, what you see is a picture, a, a drawing on the sky, basically. There's a picture of the sky and then there's 5,000 little regions where the fibers can, can go. Um, and then one of these fibers, so this is actually real data that were obtained in first light. So you can see that one spectrum actually has three portions because the spectrographs have three arms to cover the big range of colors from blue to infrared. All right, so how is Jupiter then part of this DESI project? So the, most of the software is all on GitHub for DESI. There's over 60 repositories, over 100 uh, contributors. Um, so Jupyter is a way to have pre-installed software libraries and that can talk to the data. Um, so there are tutorials that are written in notebooks, and those are super useful to train new collaboration members or for current members to learn new uh, techniques or new um, tasks. Some notebooks are also used for actually testing different versions that we have, different software releases. This is all working at NERSC, so there's a supercomputer on the back, which is great. Um, so, so far the data already includes a lot of images, catalogs, and tables. And we have a little bit of spectra, but there's a mu much more coming over the next five years when we get the full survey going. Uh, and then cosmology is the main uh, goal because this is, again, like I said, it's a dark energy experiment. But because we're going to have all of this, these data, it's going to be basically a treasure trove for discoveries. So stars, galaxies, black holes, and so on. So this is an example of accessing the, the data for DESI. This needs to be run at NERSC again. And people can already look at some of the early data that were obtained as part of the early survey validation. Or people could either generate or work with simulated data that might take into account the observing conditions and so on. And then what you can see here is one of the tools that, work, that works in the Jupyter Lab. It's called Prospect. And it's an interactive spectral viewer. So you can recognize, again, these three arms and three colors of the, the spectrum here. But this lets you zoom in, zoom out, and then plot a model and so on. So this is based on Bokeh, and it runs in Jupyter Lab. The, another use of Jupyter is for tutorials that I've already mentioned. So here I'm putting a screenshot, but you can actually browse this whole list on GitHub. And same thing, these need to be run at NERSC. And then this is an example as part of the testing part of using the Jupyter. Uh, so there's a notebook where you would simply say which version you want to test. And some jobs take longer. So instead of waiting for the cell to run, it will actually send a job in the background and it will be logged into a log file also in the background. Um, and still with sending jobs in the background, the whole notebook will take about two hours to run. Uh, and, and the last thing I wanted to say about how Jupyter is used as part of DESI it's also for education public outreach. So there's a program called Desi High. Uh, and there's going to be a talk about this by Michael Wilson at JupyterCon. So I encourage you to take a look at that. So to summarize why Jupyter and notebooks work so, so well for us, 
uh, it allows us to have this pre-install software. And in some cases, we can have multiple kernels so we can choose what to work with. And then both teams have been writing different packages to then connect Jupyter to the other portion of the science platform. So for data access and also for storage. And it's very nice to be able to use one notebook that will contain an entire uh, workflow or full example, including the documentation and the codes, which of course is what Jupyter notebooks are great for. But th this has been useful in multiple avenues, so including tutorials uh, for teaching, for testing software, but also for actual scientific analysis. And we're pretty excited about the possibility to containerize the notebooks. Uh, this brings me to the next slide about the wish list because we haven't quite done that yet. Here on the slide are also topics that we would really like to hear from other JupyterCon participants or presenters if you have ideas. One thing is we're still trying to keep improving how we teach and onboard new users. So we still think that the hardest step is the very first step from zero experience and how to become comfortable and how to learn to use uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And in our case, with the science platform, it's not just a Jupyter Notebook, we also have Python, SQL, and so on. But any uh, ideas about training and reducing this learning curve would be great. And then the last point I want to mention that I did not talk about yet is we don't yet have a good way for people to collaborate on the same notebooks. And I feel like this would be one of the most exciting possibilities for example, there's something called Google Collab uh, that allows people to work together. So you would like something kind of similar, except working directly on the Astro Data Lab server and then have voice for people to share their data and share their notebooks. So how does Jupyter play a role in astrophysical platforms? Uh, it basically ties together the software and the tools and the tutorials co-located with the data which is very useful as the data grow in both volume and complexity. There are other astronomy platforms, science platforms that are being developed. It becomes then a great opportunity because we can share common technologies and capabilities across these different platforms, which also means that users might be able to have more portable tools and be able to work across uh, from one platform to, to another. So I'll leave you with um, the slides so you can get in touch through either the website or email. And you can also find us on Twitter. And this is also my Twitter handle. Thanks for your attention.